Okay, from a, <clears throat> from a self-described failed salesman to Nobel Prize winner, that's the path our next speaker traveled on his way to scientific discovery that has influenced our ability to see and understand the microscopic world. Working with longtime friend and colleague, Harold Haas, they began to refine their super resolution technology and develop PALM, short for photo-activated localization microscopy. In recognition for Dr. Betzinger's work and continued contributions to the field of microscopy, he was named Nobel Prize winner for chemistry in 2014. Today, Dr. Betzig uh, leads a team of researchers at the Jamalia Research Campus, Howard Hughes Medical Institution in super high resolution fluorescent microscopy. Please join me in welcoming our second Nobel laureate for the evening. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here today. Um, I'm going to try to tell you about 400 years of light in 20 minutes. So we'll see how fast I can go, okay? So um, basically I want to talk about microscopes and telescopes because they're the tools that place us between the inanimate and the vast. And so if we shrunk ourselves down by about a factor of a billion, we would be the size of these nucleotides that are the building blocks of DNA. But on the other hand, if we grew ourselves by a factor of a billion, we'd only be out to the orbit of the moon. And in order to get even to the neighborhood of the Milky Way or a little bit beyond, you would have to go out another factor of, uh, of about um, 10 to the 12th or 10 to the 13th. So in other words, our closeness to a molecule is about 10 trillion times greater than our closeness to the size of a galaxy. And that galaxy is only one ten thousandth of the size of the observable universe. So whenever I feel good about myself for having a Nobel Prize, I only need to think about that and realize exactly how completely insignificant we are. It's humbling to think about that. But um, how did we get to this knowledge? Because what can we see with our naked eye? The problem is, is that for both seeing things in a distance or seeing things close up, how small we can see two objects or how distant we can see two objects depends upon how big the pupil of our eye is. The bigger the pupil, the more we can see. But that's pretty well fixed by Mother Nature. So it turns out that on the small side, we can see about a human hair, but that's about 50,000 times bigger than a molecule. On the other hand, if we look out in space, we can't see much at all. We can see the moon, we can see some st s planets as stars, we see the stars themselves, but as points, we can't resolve Neptune unless we had 50 times better vision than we have right now as a disk. So how do we know all of the stuff I just said about molecules up to the whole size of the universe? We know it because we make instruments that are capable of having much bigger pupils to have much better resolution, either at the small end or at the big end. Either an optical objective, which requires lots of lenses, or in a modern telescope like this, which uses a lot of mirror segments, there's a person inside of that that's a much bigger pupil than your eye. It can see a lot better, okay? So here's the 400 years in now 13 minutes, or 16 minutes. So, um, People have been using optical tools since antiquity, but really things started to take off at the beginning of the 17th century when, on the one hand, um, Zacharias Janssen decided instead of playing around with one lens, put two lenses together and he realized he could see smaller things than he could with one. On the other hand, there's probably an apocryphal story of this Hans Lippershey, who was a Dutch eyeglass maker and supposedly two boys were playing with the lenses outside and they looked and they could look like this and they saw a weather vane in the distance uh, very clearly and then he said, Eureka, that's the telescope. So he had two lenses to be able to see farther than anybody else. That took Europe by wildfire. That was called the Dutch perspective glass. One of the first guys who heard about it was Galileo Galilei. 
and he made one of the best telescopes at that time. And as soon as he started turning that on the heavens, he couldn't help but make discoveries everywhere. One of them was to realize that Jupiter isn't just a point, but a, a resolvable disk that had four little points that were going around it. Those are the four Galilean moons of Jupiter now. And by looking on different days, he could see that they orbited that, which was, which was of course, heretical because everybody thought everything orbited the Earth instead. Um, he was able to show that the spheres like the moon are not smooth, but have mountains and craters. He was able to show that Venus actually goes through different phases, like a sphere illuminated from a different direction. And so all of this led him gradually towards believing more and more in the heliocentric model that Copernicus had advocated earlier, but it eventually ran him afoul of the Pope, and so what happened is, is for all of his efforts, he ended up in house arrest for the rest of his life. So a cautionary tale for anybody who pursues a scientific career. <laughs> but so, um, so that was in the early 17th century. A common theme is, as a microscopist, I say we're the retarded stepchildren of astronomers because it takes us 50 years to do anything after the astronomers have already developed it. This was true here where it was really in, in the 1660s before optical microscopes really started to have a scientific contribution. These are the two giants of that time, Robert Hooke, um, who was uh, sort of a staff experimenter at the Royal Society, which had just started at that time. And he built a, a very nice microscope. He was a, really a polymath, a genius. Um, and the only reason he's not better known than now is there was an even bigger genius at the time, Sir Isaac Newton, and they hated each other's guts. And Newton actually made sure there was no, this is just a guess as to what he looked like. He, Newton took down all of the pictures of Hooke that ever existed. Because they fought over gravitation, they fought over calculus, they fought over everything. Um, by all accounts, Hooke was a hard guy to work with. Um, but he made beautiful pictures. So at, in the early 1660s was the last round of the Black Plague through London. And by making pictures like this of the fleas that were in his book, people would become less scared to be able to understand what was the threat facing them. But in addition, this book was one of the very first bestsellers, not just scientific bestseller, but bestseller period, because of the beautiful plates he had of all of the things that he could draw through that microscope. The other guy who came just shortly after that was Antoni von Leeuwenhoek. And he created these microscopes, he created over 500 microscopes. But they were made not by grinding lenses by everybody else, but he would pull a piece of glass until it was like a thread thickness, then put it in a flame and it would curl up into a little ball, and he'd break that ball off and that ball would be his lens. And it was a much more perfect ball than anybody could grind at the time. With that, he was able to go all the way down to the point where he could see bacteria. So sometimes he's called the father of microbiology. And it took a long time before people would actually believe he was seeing single-celled objects. But they, in the end, they did, and he was astounding. But he was also a secretive bastard because he didn't tell anybody that what his technique was to create those lenses. He led them to believe he was grinding them. And it was going to be 150 years before anybody made a microscope as good as Van Leeuwenhoek's again, because he took his secret to the grave with him. So, um, so microscopes and telescopes gradually improved. The telescopes quickly ran into a problem. As people tried to make bigger lenses, a bigger diameter to see farther, they ran into the problem that the different colors of light don't focus at the same point. That's called chromatic aberration. And so that problem is, is worse when you have a lens that tightly focuses, a short focal length. But with long focal length lenses, it's less of an issue. So by the time we got to Huygens and Cassini and these guys in the late 17th century, that was the vogue of what's known as aerial telescopes, where they put one of the tube lenses up on a flagpole and have a little universal joint and hold a string and hold the other lens in their hand and look like that, and then while everything's wobbling around, try to see what they could see. It was a pain in the ass to say the least, but in the end, they could see like Cassini and uh, was able to see, of course, the division in the rings that bears his name. The resolution they had was probably only a factor of two worse when everything worked right than, than we would surpass until the 1990s. 
So it was pretty amazing what they could do back then. Um, so the other way to get around this problem, and a better way, was instead of making bending light by, uh, through lenses, is to bounce it off curved mirrors to create a focus. That was the invention of that guy, Isaac Newton. Um, it turned out a spherical mirror, which is easy to make, has errors of its own, so Hadley, a few years later, figured out how to do a parabolic mirror. And then they could create a telescope that would have roughly the same resolution as the old aerial ones, but instead of being 64 meters long, it was one and a half meters long. And then things became much less unwieldy than they were. So um, there's been sort of a back and forth in history where sometimes lenses were better, sometimes mirrors were better. I'm gonna just tell you the mirror story. Um, so the mirror, mirrors got better, but the mirrors stuck, sucked because they tarnished so quickly. They were made of something called speculum, and you'd have to keep repolishing them. This guy would spend 18 hours a day polishing them and then during the day, and then in the seeing time at night, he'd go out and do his observations. And he would go around in a circle around his disc with a pole here to do, do the, the figuring of that mirror, while his sister Carolyn would feed him sandwiches while he was doing this. I mean, he was, he was actually a composer, but he got bit by the astronomy bug when he was an adult, and that was it. And so his crowning glory was this, uh, it's called the 40-foot telescope. That's him right there, okay? Um, a f 50 years later, there was something called the Leviathan of Parsonstown, which was even bigger. Um, this is a drawing that somebody made of the Whirlpool Galaxy through that telescope. And then it was another um, 50, 60, 70 years before that was surpassed in size with the Hooker Telescope at Mount Wilson. And so now at this point, this is the telescope with which Edwin Hubble was able to look at Andromeda. Before that, people weren't sure if the Milky Way was all there was to the galaxy. But by looking at variable stars, they could determine the distance. And the shock he must have felt when he finally did that back of the envelope calculation must have been as profound as Galileo's when he was looking at those moons. Because he saw that Andromeda was not part of the Milky Way, it was two million light years away. And so all of a sudden the universe became much, much bigger. So the next big event was then with the Hale Telescope in 1948. These are people at the dedication, that's the mirror. And here's the mirror blank with two people in front of it. So this ruled for about 50 years as one of the best telescopes in the world. And these are all the pictures that came out of that scope. I love these pictures because I wanted to be an astronaut as a boy. And in high school, all of those pictures were on the walls of my bedroom. Other kids would have other things. I had these pictures. I wanted to be an astronaut. So, um, so again, while all of this was happening through the 17th, 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries, Microscopy was moving forward, but the mirror idea didn't really work out as a good way of making better microscope objectives. So they had to work with more and more lenses to correct the aberrations. And at a certain point, they got pretty good. So Carl Zeiss had a company. First, he sold those single ball lens things like, uh, like Van Leeuwenhoek developed. But there's, you can see a much bigger field of view and more things if you have two elements. And so we started creating multi-element microscope objectives. He had a workshop, and, it, and he was a driven man. And he had all of these workers, and he would personally look through each microscope as it was being done and see if the quality met his standards. And if it didn't, he kept a big hammer with him, and he would just smash the, the microscope in front of the workman and say, do it again. And it frustrated the crap out of him. So what he did is there was a physicist at the local university, Ernst Abbe, a young assistant prof. He asked him to think about what is going on? Why can't I make a reproducible microsco or microscope? And so with, with uh, Abbe's help, um, they figured out that they, what they needed to do in terms of making the lenses and everything. They made them to Abbe's calculations, and sometimes it worked better, but sometimes it didn't. It turned out the glass was not very good. And so they hired a great material scientist and chemist named Otto Schott. They finally figured out how to make glass well. And eventually they came to what Abbe predicted, that there was a fundamental limit to how small you could see, which is about half of the wavelength of light. That's called Abbe's law. 
So obviously in the 100 years since those guys, the optical microscope has had a huge contribution to biology. Um, but there's, we hit a wall in both microscopy and astronomy because of another problem. The problem in astronomy is that the light from the star creates at our distance flat wave fronts that would give you a good focus in the telescope. But because of the atmosphere, those wave fronts are distorted by refractive index variations, like twinkle, twinkle, little star. So instead of seeing a point, you see that messy thing that you get there, and you don't get a good focus. It's the same phenomenon as when you have rain on your windshield bending and warping the light from the cars in front of you. Same, exact same problem happens in microscopy. As you go deeper in a sample, you lose signal and you lose resolution. So how do you deal with that? Well, one solution is put your telescope above the atmosphere. That's what the Hubble and other space telescopes are about. And you can see that even though this has half the size of the mirror of, 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 uh, of the Hale telescope, the resolution is much, much better because of the, of the lack of, of aberrations from the atmosphere. The problem with doing space telescopes in general, though, is you can't fit a very big one on your rocket and if you need to service it, the service call is pretty expensive. And that's exactly what they had to do with Hubble, but in the end it worked great. And this is one of the, in 2003, where they looked at a very dark part of space, fairly empty, and they let the, the signal integrate for weeks at a time, and they saw, oh my God, space is, again, nowhere as empty as we thought, or that it goes farther than we thought, so 13 billion light years out, we're still seeing galaxies. So, um, but there's another solution. You can, again, you can't have that big of a mirror in space, and that's what astronomers call adaptive optics. So the idea is, is you take your warped light and you bounce it off a mirror that can change its shape, and you change the shape in a way that exactly cancels the warping of the atmosphere. And then you get flat wave fronts that give you much better signal and a much better image of your thing. So here's with the Hubble Space Telescope looking at Uranus, and here it is now in the Keck telescope, which is a four times bigger mirror, but with adaptive optics. And so um, now we can actually beat, in the infrared anyway, the resolution of even the Hubble Space Telescope. And without adaptive optics and width, it's a huge difference on these types of scopes. Um, we can do the exact same game in microscopy and shine a laser into the stratosphere. They shine a laser into the stratosphere in astronomy to create a point source and measure its distortion. It's called a laser guide star. We can shine a laser into our, in this case, a zebrafish, excite fluorescence at one point and create a guide star that way. We can use that information, warp the mirror, and this is showing a, a soma of a neuron 150 microns deep in the fish. The purple stuff here are the mitochondria, the powerhouses of the cell, which are completely invisible without the adaptive optics, but with it you get something as good as if it were a single isolated cell on a cover slip. Again, you see the big gain in resolution and signal with the adaptive optics. Um, so one of the challenges in biological adaptive optics is if you want to cover a large area, you're going through different parts of your specimen, and so there's different aberrations. So this is an example of looking over a large part of the zebrafish brain, which required 20,000 different adaptive optic corrections. And, but by doing that, we're able to recapitulate diffraction-limited performance like Abbe predicted, even in something as, as messy and yucky as this. And as we move deep into the midbrain region, about 250 microns deep, we're going to turn off the adaptive optics. So that's what you would have if you had a state-of-the-art microscope without the AR. My wife, Naji, is a neuroscientist at Janelia who also developed adaptive optic techniques specifically for going into the scattering brain of mice, where we can't use a guide star, and uses this to look at neural activity by fluorescence and understand how direction selectivity is generated inside of the cortex of the mouse. So the last thing I'd like to talk about is exoplanets um, and the equivalent in, in, in microscopy. So, um, as you probably all know, there's been a lot of talk about uh, discovering these exoplanets. There's these pretty pictures, but these are artist renditions. The best telescopes in the world can see on the few closest star systems with planets that are far out. You can sort of see and resolve them, but generally you can't. So how can we resolve and see exoplanets when we can't 
resolve it? How do we get that information? Well, there are several ways. One is that the, the star is pulled by the planet into a little circle, and when it's moving closer to the Earth, it gives off bluer light. When it's moving farther away, it gives off redder light. And seeing that shift allows them to detect the effect from this planet. That was the first method that was really taking off. But now with the Kepler Space Observatory, they have this unblinking eye in space that just looks at 150,000 stars and look for changes in their intensity. If they undergo a change of intensity like this, it's because an exoplanet eclipsed part of that star. It's very, very weak and very, very difficult, but as you can see, it's also been very, very successful. So we're pulling information past the diffraction limit. So now in microscopy, you can really only see about 100 times bigger than the size of single molecules. So if that's the molecule, that's the image of the molecule in diffraction-limited microscope. So, but even though the spot is big, it's possible to find the center of that spot to much better than the diameter. The problem is, is that all those fuzzy spots run together. But in 2005, my buddy Harold and I learned about a new type of fluorescent molecule that you could turn on at will. And by using that, we were able to turn on just a few at a time with one color light and then read out the fuzzy balls in their center positions with another. So this allowed us then to find these positions to near molecular dimensions and build what we call the palm microscope. We were unemployed, so we had to do that ourselves. Harold had some equipment from Bell. He wasn't married, so we could do it in the living room. So um, this is some of the raw data we took with our collaborators at NIH. And this is after taking 20,000 frames of single molecule data. These are lysosomes inside of a cell, the fraction limit and with palm, and to better appreciate the gain in resolution, you can go like a factor of 10. So that's what got me the Nobel Prize. So nowadays we can look at almost a billion molecules in cells with, with uh, improvements upon that technology. This is a field of dividing cells. Um, but the real advantage of doing optics is to be able to look at living cells, right? Not just fixed cells. And so we have just published a paper in Science two weeks ago about extending the resolution of one super resolution technique to get very high resolution to do live cell imaging. And my final slide, since I'm already two minutes over, is to say, well, 22 minutes for 400 years isn't too bad. So um, is, is um, a microscope that we developed last year to non-invasively look at the 3D dynamics of living cells, which we call the lattice light sheet microscope. So I may have won the, the Nobel for Palm, but based on the reception of the biologists who come through, this is going to be the most impactful microscope in my career. So with that, um, I'd like to close and say, you know, what you learned by this, the, this history is just how humbling it is to think how far we've come in 400 years. You know, where were we pre-Galileo to where we are now in our understanding of the universe and our understanding of life? It's incredible. But as incredible as it is, there's so much we still don't know on either the vast side or the small side. And so it's going to be a really fun ride as we continue to develop new tools and apply them to be able to go farther in our understanding on both ends of the scale. Thank you very much.